Okay, here's the third installment of the uh, video lecture on culture here uh, for my Riverside High School students. So um, I want to kind of continue talking about norms a little bit. There are two types of norms, and these are also mentioned in your textbook, uh, mores and folkways. Um, mores are norms that are widely observed and have great moral significance. Folkways are norms for routine or casual interaction. And I'll explain that some more and give you some examples. Let's start with mores. Um, if you violate mores, you're violating um, very, very important norms, very significant norms. Um, example, our insistence that adults not engage in sexual relationships with children, that's a more within our culture. Our insistence that people not murder other individuals, uh, another example of a more. Uh, our emphasis upon the fact that people can't just waltz into someone else's home or others' homes or break in and steal stuff, that's, that's a more. So if we violate these mores, we're violating society's most important or valuable norms. Now, folkways, on the other hand, um, best example I can think of is the courtesy wave. You guys have probably been in this situation. I know I have. You're sitting in traffic. You're losing your patience. Somebody needs out. So you take a second and you let them out because you're a nice person. You expect some kind of acknowledgement. I call it the courtesy wave. Um, if they wave at you or kind of honk their horn or flash their lights, like say thank you, that's kind of like what they're doing, it's all good. Um, if they don't, if they don't give you the courtesy wave, if they just barrel right on out, don't even look at you, don't even wave at you, then that person has violated a folk way. It's not a serious violation of a norm, but it's still enough to kind of upset us a little bit. An um, appropriate dress. If I come to class in the middle of wintertime wearing shorts and a tank top and sandals, which I'm not going to do, I promise, then I have violated the folk way of dressing appropriately as a teacher in a school. There's not, there's not a law that says I have to wear a suit and a tie or I have to wear a, a nice dress shirt or whatever, but there are expectations certainly that teachers don't come to school wearing shorts and tank tops and sandals. Probably not a good idea. Another example would be, again, waiting your turn in line. I'll go back to my Walmart example. Um, if I skip line, I've not violated a moray, but I've certainly violated a folkway. Um, and people are probably going to be upset about that. Um, ideal versus real culture. Uh, these two terms are also mentioned in, in your textbook as well. Values and norms do not describe actual behaviors as much as they suggest how we should behave. Okay. So ideal culture refers to our notions about how culture really should be. So this is more of an aspiration. Real culture is how things actually um, turn out or how things actually are. Um, an example of ideal versus real culture, it's easy to go to housework to see how this works. In this country, there are tons of surveys that, that illustrate that both men and women claim that housework and child care duties should be shared equally. This represents ideal culture. So when you ask men and women separately or together, they all say, including men, yeah, we should be sharing this equally. Housework and child care should be an equal kind of a equal kind of a thing. But when it really comes down to it, you see some things actually turn out differently. Um, based on a, a sample of all U.S. families, a recent study of housework trends revealed that husbands create an extra seven hours a week of housework for wives, but wives save husbands from about an hour of housework a week. So that represents the real culture. So in actuality, what's happening is that men aren't doing as much housework as men, as women, even though they say it should be equal. Um, and it gives you some more information about the study there. And here's something that, to, uh, to kind of look at. I hope this kind of shows up here a little bit. Um, weekly hours, <coughs> excuse me, a basic housework by gender. In 1976, what you're going to find is that men are the light blue column, or the light blue, and women are the dark blue uh, there. So in 1976, men were doing about six to seven hours um, of housework every week. Women were doing 25, 26 hours. That's a big difference. So you think we've come a long way. You fast forward to 2005, it's more even. But still, women are doing most of the housework. Men are doing about 12, it looks like, hours of housework a week, while women are still doing about 16 or 17 hours of housework a week. 
Uh, the amount of housework done by women has de decreased since 1976, while the housework done by men has doubled. So men are catching up, but there's still a gap. There's still a gap there. And this comes from the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research. Uh, we can break it down in terms of married versus single. In 1976, uh, married men is the light blue uh, there. Uh, again, about six, seven hours a week. Uh, single men, let me, let me back that up, I'm sorry. Married men is the light blue column. So married men are doing the least amount of housework of anybody uh, in 1976. Single men uh, in the darker blue there in 1976, as you can see, hopefully, um, are doing a little bit more. They're doing about eight hours a week. Uh, married women are doing almost 30 hours a week of housework. 30 hours. That's like almost like, you know, it's almost like a, a real job in terms of hours you're putting in. Uh, and single women, even single women are doing almost 20, like 18 or 19 hours a week. Now, fast forward to 2005, a little different. Men who are married are doing about 13 or 14 hours a week. Single men are doing close to 10. They're like about 8 or 9. So that hasn't changed. Single men are still doing just as much housework uh, in 2005 as they were doing in 1976. Uh, married women are doing about 18 hours of housework a week. Single women are doing about 13 or 14. So there you go. Um, so what we see is that the amount of housework done by men and women varies according to their marital status. Um, again, that's just just explains this slide. Just explains what I just said. So, and you can pause this, and, and you have I think you have most of this in your PowerPoint that I've given you. Uh, one more example of ideal versus real culture, and being a, a psychologist in a in, in working with people, uh, this is kind of a big issue. This is one of the big deal issues that that uh, we try to help people with marital uh, and relationship fidelity or monogamy. In the U.S., the vast majority of both men and women claim infidelity is a big problem, um, and it is not okay. That's the ideal culture. So men and women both say that you know fidelity and being faithful is, is really important, um, but research gives us some eye-opening uh, statistics here. A uh, percentage of marriages where one or both spouses admit to infidelity, either physically or emotionally, 41%. Percentage of men who admit to committing infidelity in any relationship, not just being married, but in any relationship, almost 60%. It's at 57%. Percentage of women who admit committing infidelity in any relationship they've had, over half, 54%. So it's not just men. Uh, percentage of men and women who admit having an affair with a co-worker, 36%. Percentage of men and women who admit to infidelity on business trips, 36%. Percentage of men and women who admit infidelity, and we're talking about emotional or physical, with a brother or sister-in-law, 17%. Uh, the average length of an affair is approximately two years. A percentage of marriages that last after an affair has been admitted to or discovered, only 31% of those marriages survive once an affair has been uncovered. Uh, and this is also pretty... Uh, Eye-opening. Percentage of men who say they would have an affair if they knew they would never get caught, 74%. Percentage of women who say they would have an affair if they knew they would never get caught, 68%. So, wow. So, that's the real culture. The ideal culture is that men and women say, no, this is a problem. We shouldn't cheat on each other. But the real culture is just these numbers that I've been showing you. It happens a lot and all the time. Uh, we talk about the difference between high culture and popular culture. And your book talks about this as well. High culture refers to cultural patterns that distinguish a society's elite. Popular culture, which is where most of us will, will kind of fall, cultural patterns that are widespread among a society's population. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, high culture, which has nothing to do with marijuana, by the way. Insert laughter for that joke, if you will. Okay. Anyway, fine. Don't laugh. It's a term used for the rich class of people. Uh, high culture is known in the elite circles uh, in the world. Some examples of high culture are ballets, operas, art museums, five-star restaurants, black tie events, etc. Things that probably a lot of us don't get to experience on a regular basis. Very expensive. And a lot of these are by invitation only. So a few images here of an opera house. 
uh, very expensive uh, art museums. And some of the museums are very expensive just to get into. We're not even talking about purchasing art necessarily. Uh, Five-star restaurants. Now, pop culture, on the other hand, uh, is based on popular taste. Uh, these are things that most of us can, can kind of get a hold of. Uh, in the 70s, you had bell-bottom jeans, flower power, peace signs. In the 80s, you had big hair, shoulder pads, 90s pop culture, PlayStation, industrial music. Uh, 2000, 2010, you had the, uh, the advent of, well, not the advent, but you had the popularity of reality TV, uh, Survivor, Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire, all that good stuff. Uh, now, we've got um, things that are in the media, like the, the, the marriage of Prince William and Kate Middleton, uh, the travails of Lindsay Lohan, uh, things on Twitter, texting, tweeting, uh, social media. So these are all things that you probably can get your hands on that you've had some experience with. And these tangible items that go with pop culture are, are easy for most of us to get a hold of, even if we don't make a whole lot of money. So I'm guessing that you've all probably been to McDonald's. That's a big symbol of pop culture. Shopping, you see the, the young ladies at the bottom shopping there. Uh, sporting events, football. Um, football is the most popular sport in this country by far. Uh, your, your iPhones, I'm sure all of you have a cell phone or an iPhone. Um, tell, that's a television set up in the top uh, right-hand corner. You probably all have televisions. A lot of you probably have high-definition TVs. These are things and activities that we probably all have access to and enjoy to some extent. Now, we've talked about ethnocentrism as meaning looking at and evaluating different cultures through our own cultural lens. Um, and we have a tendency to do that. And I use the example of the tribe from Sambia, or the Sambia tribe from New Guinea. Um, there's a really good article that talks about this, and I'd love for you guys to be able to go online and find it. Uh, New York Times, March 6, 1999. The title of it is When One's Culture's Custom is Another's Taboo. And it's not really long. It's easy to read, and I've got the uh, I've, I've got the internet I've got the address down there. You can kind of see that, so you can pause this, jot it down, take a picture of it with your phone, and uh, I, I would like you to kind of look at that. We might talk about that. Probably will talk about that at some point. Uh, here's a, um, here's an example of ethnocentrism. Uh, in Maine, a refugee from Afghanistan was seen kissing the penis of his baby boy, a traditional expression of love by, by this father. To his neighbors and the police, it was child abuse and sexual assault, and his son was taken away. So within his part of the world, this was a traditional expression of love, and no one would think much about it. However, within our culture, we look at that and evaluate that as being sick and being illegal and being immoral. Uh, in Seattle, a hospital tried to... Uh, invent a harmless female circumcision procedure to satisfy conservative Somali parents wanting to keep an African practice alive in their community. Uh, the idea got buried in criticism from an outraged public. So with, again, within their part of the world, uh, this was seen as normal, normative. Within our part of the world, we see this as being cruel and inappropriate. Um, how do democratic, pluralistic societies like the United States uh, based on religious and cultural tolerance, respond to customs and rituals that may be repellent or just disgusting to the majority. Um, again, we are a melting pot. We are truly the, and probably the most culturally diverse country in the world. And we have people coming into our country from all over the world and bringing with them a lot of their cultural customs, traditions, and values. So it, it gets tricky. Balancing cultural variety with mainstream values gets to be, uh, gets to be tricky. Uh, multiculturalism is a perspective recognizing the cultural diversity of the United States and promoting equal standing for all cultural traditions. We live in a multicultural society. I mentioned this before in Queens, New York, probably the most culturally diverse area in the U.S. Uh, the New York City public school system has students from 189 different countries. Um, about 50% of the residents in Queens were born outside of the U.S. and There are over 200 languages spoken in Queens alone. So that gives you an idea of how culturally diverse uh, we are, uh, especially when you look at Queens, New York here, for example. So a couple of images of Queens that you can kind of see there. And that's it for this installment. Uh, thank you.